Hello, everyone. Welcome back to I See What You're Saying, the Discipline Listening Podcast. I'm Mike Reddington, and today it is my pleasure to introduce our next guest, David Casper. David is the CEO of Union Diversified Industries, an organization that serves adults with developmental and intellectual disabilities. David is a student of leadership, a dedicated servant leader, somebody who is solely focused on building into other people and currently with his organization focused on giving adults, like we said, with developmental and intellectual disabilities, the support and opportunities that the rest of us take for granted, whether that's opportunities to engage in the community, act as a consumer, hold a job, engage in social relationships, find alternative means of communication and experience and happiness and joy. David's experience connecting and supporting others, particularly those with disabilities, has given him insights, perspectives, and ideas that we can all apply to all of our relationships in our community, in our businesses, and in our families. Every time I talk to him, I hear about another story, another example, something else that he has learned that I can turn around and integrate into my relationships every time I speak with him. I'm really excited for this conversation. I'm really excited for him to share his insights and stories with the world and hopefully give some of you the opportunity to learn a little bit more about the experiences that people with disabilities have, their experiences, their challenge, and how much sometimes even the littlest things that we can do to support them mean the world to them. And Dave has some great advice towards the end of the conversation on opportunities for us to get involved and support them in the best way possible as well. So I'm very, very, very excited to bring this conversation with David to you today. Before we get started, we do have to make sure we thank our sponsors. Of course, we have Humantel. For anyone who is interested in learning or developing the skill of how to accurately identify somebody's changing emotions based on how those emotions are leaking through their facial expression and nonverbal behavior, please check out humantel.com. Check out their content, read their articles, check out the videos, learn more about Dr. Matsumoto and his team. And if you're interested in taking the training, please enter the code INCLUSIVE25 for 25% off the best in-class online training for identifying shifting emotions through somebody else's facial expressions and behavior. I personally vouch for it. I've taken it all. You will learn to see things that you won't be able to unsee after. I highly recommend it. We have Emotional Intelligence Magazine as well. Thank you to Emotional Intelligence Magazine. Please check out ei-magazine.com in order to access their interviews, their webinars, books, articles, and beyond their ever-expanding content of emotional intelligence-related material. Please check them out. And of course, for the professional interviewers who may be listening, head over to certifiedinterviewer.com to learn more about the International Association of Interviewers. Learn more about the organization to see if membership is right for you and your team. Certainly check out the Certified Forensic Interviewer designation. See if you qualify and if that's right for you at this point in your career. And while you're there, learn about the networking opportunities, the legal updates, the job postings that you can find there. Check out their recorded events, their online events. Find out when their next in-person training event is coming as well. They have so much going on. Please head over to certifiedinterviewer.com for the International Association of Interviewers. Once again, thank you very much for joining us. We do truly appreciate it. And now without further ado, I'd love to introduce to you, David Casper. Good morning, David. It is so great to see you. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us today. Thank you, Mr. Reddington. I appreciate it. I assume I can call you Michael now that we've been around each other so long. Please, you can call me Mike if you want. Just don't ever call me Mr. Reddington again. That's all I ask. <laughs> but I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. As we were talking earlier, for me, when we decided to kick this podcast off, there were really two sets of goals that are intertwined, of course. One is to try to share as many perspectives, ideas, approaches to listening and communication with people as we can to help everyone develop that toolbox. But also on the other hand, was really to find an opportunity to share these stories, ideas, and perspectives of people that others might not know about or might not appreciate or might not understand just based on their busy lives and where they typically spend their time and their energy. And I'm so excited to have this conversation today because you have, as you mentioned, we have spent some time together before and I'm dangerously educated on your background and your organization's mission. Uh, but you run an organization, a nonprofit organization, specifically dedicated to supporting adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And there is so much to learn 
from that process. So before we get started and I just brag about you for the next 25 minutes, could you please do us a favor and walk us through at least the highlights of your journey that led you to taking over UDI? Sure. Uh, It was an interesting journey to say the least. Uh, My background is not in IDD work. Uh, For the last, say, 10, 12, 15 years, uh, I have been exclusively in IDD work as my career. Um, I started out, I went to college uh, at Wingate University. Um, I got a degree in religion and walked through uh, ordination, licensing, and all that fun stuff to spread the gospel across the world and started a church plant right here in good old Union County. Um, And if you know anything about church plants, you know that that doesn't pay the bills. And so I took on various jobs. I did fashion work. I did jewelry store managing. I uh, went around and got uh, contracts and did construction for a little while and then found my footing uh, in a mental health clinic. And really felt like that's where my path was starting. And so I worked with juvenile defenders, kids that had been in the system, helping them kind of normalize back uh, to a home environment. And then from there, took that skill set to a company that is one of the larger providers of services in North Carolina and kind of started at the bottom and worked my way up. Found myself at a moment in my career where travel was kind of all the time and wanted to be at home more. Uh, interviewed for a role here at UDI and uh, was named in the succession plan for the CEO. Uh, come here to take over the CEO role. And the rest is kind of history. I like to tell folks on my first interview with UDI, I walked through and there was a young man that flipped around with gray, salty gray hair. And uh, he was someone that I partnered with in Special Olympics some 25 years prior. Um, and he knew my name instantaneously. And I was really in a place then to where I kind of felt like this was a full circle moment for me. And so regardless of what UDI could pay, I came. And that kind of makes the history. That's an amazing little nugget right there. How the universe works. You walk into an interview. Is this right for me? Is this what I really want? Is this my future? And then you have that one moment that tells you I'm home. Yeah. It was fantastic. And, you know, I can remember years ago when I partnered with him, I was in, you know, school I was a kid. I didn't really understand much about disabilities and people with disabilities. And at that time, he referred to himself as uh, Stone Cold Billy. And if you do any, uh, you know, research real quick on Stone Cold, that's Stone Cold Steve Austin from uh, wrestling. And I was scared to death all day long that I was going to get a Stone Cold Stunner, you know, (laughs) during Special Olympics. And I went home as a kid and I was like in that place where it was like, okay, that was weird, but at the same time, the best thing I've ever done. And so I kind of felt like I could do something to make an impact in the field, but life just got in the way, right? You go through things, you feel like God's leading you on a pathway. um, You follow that um, and you don't realize sometimes that you can get what you desire and do what is desired of you. And so uh, this is one of those cool moments where my my journey just kind of collided with what I call my mission, which is to build people. And so uh, when I come here, he was no longer Stone Cold Billy. He was Batman Billy. And I think the other day he was telling me now they call him Mellow Yellow. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe a Days of Thunder reference in there. I'm not not so sure. And I love what you said in there about getting what you desire while doing what is desired of you. And that is such a a difficult balance for people, regardless of their career, their stage in life, or what they're doing. That in of itself was a very powerful statement. You mentioned that your mission is to build people. And I've seen that, I guess, firsthand, secondhand, one and a half hand with with the time that that we've spent together. Um, If you could, I'd love you to elaborate on that and educate us a little bit on UDI's mission as well. And I should probably say that Union Diversified Industries, correct? I got the I correct. So Union Diversified Industries is the name of the organization. So if, if you could help us understand a little bit more about how you execute your mission and the organization's mission as well. Sure. So first, let me tell you about my journey to build people. Um, to build others, you first have to build yourself. 
right? So I got a couple of certifications under my belt, become a trainer in several things, um, and then went to work trying to help others better their careers. Um, my goal is everyone that works for me, leave me in a better place. Um, sometimes that happens beautifully and you're so proud. You feel like a parent sending your kid off to college. And then sometimes it doesn't because you part ways under bad circumstances. Uh, and then you feel terrible that you couldn't help impact them in a different way. Um, but hope that you imparted enough that they will move on in a positive manner. Um, so it's, it's kind of a mixed bag. And so, uh, that's leadership, right? You don't always get what you want. Um, Mick and the boys, they sang about that a little bit, I believe. <laughs> um, but I think uh, for UDI, our mission is pretty clear, enhance lives. That's it. Um, we do that in the IDD space, intellectual and developmental disability space. Um, we take folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities and we give them some type of support to enhance their lives, whether that's respite on the weekends so that their caregiver gets a break and they get to do something they don't get to do normally, or that's a skill building service during the week uh, where they get some training on how to do things uh, in their home or in the community, or whether that's coming to our day program and getting full scale start to finish lifelong learning creative arts, employment, which is what we're known for. A lot of folks that know of UDI know that we employ about uh, 85 adults with special needs every day in our manufacturing. And we employ a significant number of other folks with disabilities as well that aren't specifically mission-based, but kind of what I would call that quadrant four mission-based um, because we just are here to enhance lives. And if we can do that, why not? And so uh, we have a mixed uh, workforce. We do contract work for various companies, sub-assembly, and then we use the profits from that to funnel right back into services for people with disabilities, whether that's pro bono services, grant-based services, whatever that is. Um, and so it makes for a pretty well-rounded uh, portfolio. We've expanded our footprint kind of uh, over the past several years, and our next big move is to expand our footprint in the home and community-based sector and do some supported employment. And we're looking at doing some school-based work as well. So we're really trying to enhance lives. And that's what I tell our staff, every staff meeting, 15 minutes or less, by the way, um, every staff meeting, um, we start off our day talking about whose life we enhanced and how we did it. And so we want someone to tell a story about how we, you know, we just focus directly on mission from the start of the meeting. And then we move through the meeting from there. Um, we try to make it very clear. I don't know if you've ever read like Patrick Lencioni or anyone like that, but if you're going to be an effective leader, the best thing you can do is make things clear. And here it is to enhance lives. That's my personal mission. I want to make people around me better. And, and that's our company's mission to make people better. So we've taken people from very difficult situations with very challenging uh, uh, things in their life, such as disability, right? Maybe not have full functioning of their hands or their feet or even their mind and giving them a place to succeed and to grow. And I think that's um, one of the most rewarding things that I can do with my time. Oh, there's no doubt. There's no doubt. The work that you and your team does is amazing. The impact, and we'll start to talk about this later on, but the impact that it has on their lives, the impact that it has on the caregivers' lives, and, and you guys being there making these opportunities happen is really significant. You said something previously that I want to use as a bridge to talk a little bit more about that impact. You mentioned that earlier in your career, you worked with juveniles and young kids that had been in the system and experienced some trouble and probably had made some regretful decisions. And a lot of that, especially at that age, could largely be due to circumstances outside of their control. The hand they were dealt, the family they were born into, the environment that they were born into. They only know what they know. They only know what they've seen or what they've shown. And unfortunately, you know, you talk about past, sometimes they can be forced. They don't, cho they don't choose. They can be forced down a very difficult road. I'm curious how your experience supporting kids in some of those very, very challenging situations set you up for success in your current role all these years later? Yeah, I think the biggest thing that I learned from that time period was not to assume anything. Um, we have a lot of preconceived notions and it normally drives a narrative in our head and, and it will keep us from seeing things that we would be able to see otherwise. And so dropping the assumptions and just taking things as they come 
really helped me kind of first hear from them in a way that probably people hadn't spent time hearing um, and then connect with them in a meaningful way. I remember very distinctly one time that, you know, and this is back in the days where, you know, they did physical restraints. Those were very much a part of that kind of environment. And there was this one young man who kept like almost like clockwork during certain points of the day, antagonizing staff and doing things that he knew would prevent a a restraint. And those restraints were more like a basket hold where you kind of just wrap their arms and, you know, just hold them until they're safe. It's for their safety. It's for your safety. It's for the people around you's safety. It's not like you're abusing them, um, but you were having to do something, intervene in a way that would promote safety. And so I, I just kept feeling like he was smiling when it would happen. And so after some sessions one-on-one with him, I, I, I found out that he really just wanted a hug. And so we're assuming that his behavior is because he wants to be non-compliant. And his behavior was actually, he wanted a hug. And so we worked on putting things in his life where he could ask for what he need needed without being ashamed of that, right? Because he grew up in an environment and grew up on the streets where asking somebody for a hug wasn't necessarily the best thing. And so by the time I finished working with him, I mean, I, I couldn't remember the last time that someone had to restrain him because we built in him the tools to be able to ask for what he needed. But that assumption, they come predisposed. They're violent juvenile defenders. They and they got all these labels. And, and once you peel back the labels and don't make any assumptions about them, like you said, sometimes they're forced into these paths. They don't make these choices. These are things these are survival moments for them. And, and, you know, we know a lot about survival and we see folks in very bad situations make very bad choices they would have never made otherwise. And so I think the biggest thing I learned is just not to assume anything and just let it take me where it's naturally going to go. And that helps me here every day. I don't assume someone's able or not able. I don't assume someone has the ability to learn or not. I come in and we just see where it goes. And I think that's that's paid dividends in in my field, at least. I have no doubt. That's an incredible bridge and a fantastic story. Or should say fantastic illustration or example. Saying that's a fantastic story could be a dangerous place. I don't want that to be interpreted the wrong way. But using that story is a fantastic illustration. And you're so correct. One of the most dangerous things we can do is put any label on anyone. And it's natural. That's how our brains work. We want things to be classified. We want them to make sense. They want to fit into the model of the world that we see it. So we don't have to think about it. We don't have to deal with it. We don't have to feel anything about it. We know it is defined. We move on. But when we do that, it starts creating these self-fulfilling prophecies. If I label somebody as unable, I will miss anything they say or do that shows me they're actually able. If I label somebody as a bad kid, that I'm going to look at them and treat them as if they are a bad kid and I'm going to perpetuate the problem. I think back to so many investigations that my former teammates and I were involved with and we would come out with these written statements and people would say, well, that's how, that guy was a multiple time felon or that young man was involved in all these other things. How come he talked to you? It's exactly for what you just said. No judgment, listening, give him the opportunity to talk, feel heard, feel experienced as a human being safe face, protect their self-image and share on their own time. So especially if we have somebody young, like you're illustrating, they only know what they've been forced to experience. So are they looking for control? Are they looking for attention? Are they looking for affection? And if they come from a home, unfortunately, where they were abused, some of these things start falling in line. So maintaining that situational awareness, withholding judgment, taking things as they come, allowing people to illustrate what they're capable, what they feel, what they need. That's, so powerful and so important. And I'm sure not only pays dividends in your job currently, your role, but really in your life as you interact with people. I know you have a big role in multiple boards and nonprofits and different things that you do around here in the county, but with all of your interactions. Yeah. As you know, and you know, this, I work at a small church. I mean, that's kind of why I work a full-time job is to be able to do my passion which is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, And I don't mix the two because it's, you know, it's kind of difficult 
uh, when you're working in a secular environment to to not or to force your ideologies of religion, right? So that's not appropriate for my work environment. So we keep that in the church and, you know, I come here and folks, it's okay to do that. You're okay to have your faith and your belief system. Um, you're not okay to force that on everyone else. Um, and so, but I think it's really cool that not only do I not assume things here at work or about employees, but I don't do that in a, in a, in a social setting or a religious setting either, which makes it really strange. My wife always asks me, why do people just tell you everything? And I'm like, because I don't judge them. There's no judgment because the moment they feel judged, they're not going to give you anything to, to have something to feed back and forth. It shuts down. It's a barrier of conversation. Um, I wrote uh, minimally intrusive intervention techniques. I co-authored that with a gentleman named Mike, and it's a state-approved curriculum for preventing uh, aggressive behaviors and also for uh, uh, choosing different pathways for seclusion, restraint, those type of things. And, you know, one of the barriers is judgment, right? That's that's a barrier even to learning. Oh, you're not, you're a C student. You can't, you can't really grasp this concept. Well, there's been a lot of people that have been told they couldn't, that they can, and then they come back and run the place, you know? So uh, I think judgment is something you check at the door and, and working with people teaches you that every single day. You can chisel that in stone. If I'm excited to continue the conversation. I don't know. We can only tie saying something as important as that. I don't know. It's going to be hard to say something more important. Maybe we will. But withholding judgment, when somebody feels judged, they shut down. This is now an adversarial conversation. I'm, be I'm better off protecting myself and not letting this get any worse than I am engaging with somebody who judges me. You are spot on correct with that. I don't use the term judge. I just say don't assume, mm -hmm. right? Because in, in the disability world, we're not making judgments. We're making assumptions. Um, right. and, and it's because most of us aren't qualified to make those judgments, right? Because in, in my field, if you're not, you know, credentials this long past your name, then it doesn't really matter what you have to say in a clinical setting, right? Mm -hmm. As a psychologist can come in and write whatever he wants, and that's the label they get. Sure. And so we're making assumptions. We're not really making judgments. That's the joke. Um, <laughs> because we're not paid enough to make those judgments. <laughs> <laughs> Good clarification. I appreciate that. Let's talk about the impact that you see in your current role. So you you gave the illustration previously. You've been with UDI, and I can certainly shower you with compliments for how you steered the organization and grown the organization and the impact that I've seen you have within the organization in the time that you've been there. But let's talk about the impact that the people you serve have had on you personally. How have they impacted you as, first, let's just start with a human being spending the time and watching the effect that your organization has on their daily lives? Yeah, I think one of the things that really impacted me the most, and I have it here in my office, it's a painting. Um, they're a very talented young man that works here um, and in, had just sketched something out in his free time, painted it. And man, it was just beautiful. Like it's a, it's a wolf. Um, vibrant colors, just really stand out type piece. And so I just kind of started feeding that art habit by buying it. Right. So here's 50 bucks. Let's buy you some more canvases. Let's get you some paint because you got something. And I think what it did is it made me a person that wants to invest in people more and find the niche that they want to be in. Um, so I'm forever finding myself saying, is this what is this what drives you? Is this what you're happy with? Is this what you would like to do? Is this how you would like to be seen? And then if it is, how can I put the supports with you to make that possible? And so as a human being, it just made me care more, really, for people and their unique abilities, because each person that we serve here has phenomenal in some way, shape or form and can instantaneously make you angry and melt your heart. And that is something that you don't really encounter often, uh, is that dichotomy of 
behavior as well as empathy, right? And so it just kind of, for me, it, it's always a roller coaster here because in one moment you could be on cloud 10 because someone just learned to tie their shoes for the first time. And then you can be back down at ground zero because someone's caregiver is not giving them the proper care. Yeah. Right. And so you have to make very difficult decisions and call people and get people involved. And so I think it just made me be more human. And and when I think humanity, I think that humanity is is caring. Right. I think at our very core, all of us care about each other. We just don't always know how to appropriately do it. That's a great way to phrase it. And I do feel like spending time that you are with your is client base the right word to use? Like we talked about this before, and I'm it's individual it's, serve client base. It, it really varies. So with with the client base that you serve, it can. Well, I say it can only. I guess there's exceptions to every rule. It should only increase our empathy because we are growing and learning and and experiencing how different people see the world or hear the world or work through the world every day. And they make so much out of the opportunities that they have. And they do have these skills that oftentimes might just be hidden and need to be uncovered. And how we learn to connect and motivate each one of these individuals literally translates to how we can connect and motivate anybody else that we interact with. I'll give you a cool story. So we got a guy here who um, he, his reward system is he, he works and once he hits a certain point, he can engage in preferred activity. It's a motivator to keep him engaged throughout the day because he has, you know, autism and the attention span is challenging, but scheduling is very important. Mm -hmm. And so um, I noticed that he was going to the computer and writing full sentences in the search bar. And then he's nonverbal. And I'm sitting here scratching my head thinking, OK, if he's writing full sentences with punctuation, it's not that he can't communicate. We haven't found the right way yet. And so this gentleman had been years of services from multiple agencies and no one had ever given this young man a communication tablet. So he bought a communication tablet, handed him a communication tablet. And the first thing he types is, thank you so much for giving me a way to communicate. I love to tell jokes. Let me tell you one. I'm like, geez, man. Missing the freaking boat, right? Oh. And so it's like now he has a way to communicate where he never had that previously. And we learn that by just paying attention to what he preferred to do. He preferred to communicate in a way through sentences, not through pictures, not through the schedules we had, not through, but through typing sentences. And I was like, man. First, I felt terrible that I had not noticed that sooner or anyone on my team. But it takes time when you have many barriers between you and what someone's saying. Mm -hmm. Right. And your podcast is I see what you're saying. And literally, I had to see it physically before I could understand what this guy's been trying to tell us. And thank goodness you have the awareness to jump on it. it wait a minute. He's typing full sentences. It could have been natural for a large group portion of society to go, oh, wow, he can type full sentences and just walk on by. And that's not being negligent. That's not being disrespectful. That's like a moment of curiosity in an otherwise busy day. I've got someplace I need to be. I'm continuing to travel in that direction. But you having the situational familiarity, the focus on investing in people and making better, metaphorically speaking, a little bit of a brick to the face. They, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> There's something really impactful. And then to experience him being so happy and so excited for that. We love to say, how do we create the communication experiences other people need? And I will likely never have a better example than that. Well, you know, autism is an interesting diagnosis and it's different for everyone. So I call it a spectrum. But for him, he was very much not a touch person. He stemmed in his own way. He um, kind of maintained some space and distance. He didn't like noise. But since then, this young man has like hugged me. He is, I mean, because we we opened a pathway for him to say what he's wanted to say the whole time. And and I think it's imperative that we take that extra moment and figure out how people prefer to communicate. 
Some people prefer to communicate in jargon that is not what I would consider normal business jargon, right? So they don't want to add the therefores and the howevers. They want to, you know, do a little job talking and that's perfectly fine. And if that's the way that you can communicate with them, by God, you better learn how to job talk and communicate with them, right? Because if not, you're going to miss what they're trying to tell you. Um, and I've said this repeatedly to pastors across our conferences. Um, Paul said, I've become all things to all men that I may reach them for, for, for Christ, right? So you're going to have to learn to talk like they talk or to communicate the way they communicate if you ever want to hear what they got to say. You're so right. I had a, a woman on, Stephanie Hoover, recently who was a tremendous interrogator. And one of the things that we talked about was being who the other person needs us to be. So they can open up. It's And we talk about this with the leaders we work with all the time. It's not about forcing our preferred communication style on somebody else. It's being adept enough in order to adapt so somebody else feels comfortable talking to us. And we can create that common bond in order to achieve the goal. The story you just told is the quintessential answer for a follow-up question that I was going to ask. But I'm going to ask it anyway, in case there's an opportunity to expand on it. How have you seen your work impact the people that your team serves? Sure. I, I, so we have a young man here that works. Uh, he, he's just employed by us. He receives no services. Um, we've taught him to drive a forklift. He has mild IDD. We've taught him how to drive a forklift. We've kept him engaged. We treat him just like a regular employee. He gets any, like if we do employee lunches, we, his, his confidence has went from the bottom to the top, right? His desire to do preferred behaviors has drastically changed where there were some maladaptive behaviors, some difficulties at home, you know, building into him that he is someone who is valued has changed everything about this young man. And I think that payday at UDI is, is a good example of the impact that we're making on people. We're giving them the ability to be consumers for the first time, some of them. We're giving them the ability to contribute to their church for the first time or to take their mom to dinner and thank her for, there's a young man every Thursday, he comes to my office, he says, you pay me tomorrow. And I have to remind him, we only pay every two weeks. <laughs> and then he says, I take mom to lunch and go to Walmart and get a video. That's his routine. Every payday, he takes mom. And so for the first time, these the individuals that we support are empowered to do things that they don't normally get the opportunity to do. And to me, that's what I call enhancing lives. Um, we change the way they're viewed. We change the way they impact others. We change the way they interact with each other sometimes referee and the boyfriend, girlfriend arguments or whatever. So, I mean, I think our team does a phenomenal job at just taking a population who has been relegated to unimportant matters or has been, uh, sorry. Don't well, apologize. You're good. Um, so they, Take, our team takes folks that have been kind of pushed to the corner, right, uh, and 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 puts them on display because their abilities are so powerful that the rest of us should simply sit back and think, God, I wish I could do that, right? They're persevering through some of the most difficult challenges and still making a tremendous effort to accomplish something. We have a young man here. He's in a wheelchair. He has CP. And yet he's still working every single day with impairments that most of us would give up with. And I think it just goes to show us as we build into them, they're really just proven why they are the leaders and we are the followers, right? That's a beautiful way to say it. And again, I love the phrase building into, and it's, I can't, and we've talked before and I have some background in, in what you do, so I'm not entirely foreign to, to what you're talking about, but the things we take for granted, I just want to take my mom to lunch. I just want to be a consumer. I want to go to the store and I want to buy a video or a game or a new shirt or whatever it is. Yep. 
things that for you and I, I might be like, Oh, I got to find the time to go to the store and get a new shirt for somebody else. That is a amazing experience that they've only had a few times if they've had it at all. And it's just, Seeing the value, seeing the potential, not falling prey to the labels, not making some of those assumptions that we talked about before and building into them. And I believe we're having an extremely important conversation today about your clientele, about the people with the disabilities who you serve. This is entirely analogous to leading teams or raising families or working in scenarios where we are interacting with people that don't experience the same challenges. We don't if we haven't taken the time to learn, we don't know how they prefer to be communicated to or how they prefer to communicate. We might not know what environment best suits them as far as being productive or encourages them to open up and share more information. What makes them happy? What are they missing in their lives? What are they working towards? What do they want? All of these things over time and appropriately, especially in the business setting, the more we learn to understand those, the better. Earlier, you said something that reminded me when I was doing the research for the book, I came across a research study where they were working with a group of um, boys from two groups of boys from economically challenged backgrounds. And they were working with them specifically because this group and this environment in the city is known to struggle on standardized testing. So they split these boys up into two equal groups And they put them through the same preparation process prior to the test. They told one group, people like you typically struggle on these exams. So it's important that you study hard and do well because people don't expect you to do well. This group typically struggles. They took the other group. All demographics identical. They took the other group and said, you're smart. You can do this. We believe in you. You're going to do great on this exam put them through the same process and the group that was told you're great, you're smart, you can be successful, did substantially better. And I apologize for not having the actual statistics. I don't have them fresh on my head and I don't want to misquote the study, but the group that was told we need you to do well, study hard because your group typically struggles, struggles. So how we build into people and how we show that belief and how we give them that support means so much. I mean, we're, we call it anticipatory guidance. Right. So we know someone has a difficult time transitioning between activities here in our facility. We start working on that transition a good 20 minutes beforehand. Hey, we're coming up on lunch. You know, we're going to get your bag. We're going to go to the lunchroom. We're going to have lunch and then we're going to come back to work. I mean, we're coaching them through what's coming to help them make that transition. And I think, you know, we don't do that with our teams. That's why teams struggle with change so much is we're not giving them enough time to understand change is coming. We're not prepping them in a manner that is suitable for their needs. And we're not giving them the space to 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 grow into that change, whether it's moment by moment or over time. And I think that's one of the things that our team has done really well with is figuring out. A, how do people, you know, digest that information and then put it into action? And then B, uh, when they do put it into action, what do they need around them to put it into action and be productive? Have a young man here when I got here, he wasn't engaged in work. He was in a kind of almost self-contained situation where one-to-one worker um, wasn't doing much other than kind of engaging in preferred tasks, which just so happened to be listening to music He did not want to participate in any other group setting stuff. So it was very challenging. And I started getting to know this individual. Now this individual is in a workstation. He has flexible seating where he can sit in different ways. He has STEM toys. He has fiber optic lights. He has a grandfather clock or a grandmother clock that clicks the time away for him. Big schedule on the wall. And now he's one of our best producers because we found out what he needed and put it around him so that he could do it. And I think that's important for all of us to remember, no matter what our job is, that people will perform at good levels if you do your homework and give them the tools to do it. Amen. 
And somebody might be listening and think, well, you know, I'm not going to give them a clock or, you know, some of these special things. Okay. You know, every story and every individual is going to be different, but if somebody is listening and saying, I shouldn't have to do that, my answer would be, you're right. You shouldn't have to, but you do (laughs) to some degree. And however it's appropriate for any organization, any team, any group, there's a scale, you know, it's certainly going to be different where it falls and what teams require or people require, but making these individual efforts to learn, to connect the output, even if we have a traditional business leader that is concerned about profit and production and margin and all of those things, at this point, the research is substantial It's inarguable. The more people have what they need, the better your production will be, the higher your profit will be, the better the margin will be in the long run because we're making the investment in that direction. Now, we we work with a predominant workforce of people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. I've been here just over five years, just over four years in the CEO role because I come in on that transition period. Um, And we have introduced more activities more integrative situations. We've introduced more, you know, preferred activity time, more community outings, more integration. We've sent people away from work more than we ever have. And we're producing five times the amount we were when I first started. And people say, how does that happen? Because happy people, when you found what they like and how they love to engage and you give it to them, they're going to do everything they can to deliver everything possible back to you. Um, it's the concept of, do you give before you get? And in, I don't care if you're in a negotiation table or an interrogation room or in a workplace. You're not getting anything until you give something. I love it. I love it. And when you think, too, about the people that you were specifically referencing earlier, you used the phrase, they've been shoved in a corner. And it is quite possible, however tragic and unfortunate, it's quite possible that your team are the first people that stuck out a hand and helped get them from that corner and got them comfortable. And this didn't happen overnight with each individual. The story is different, but over a period of time, built the trust, gave the examples, gave people proof, something tangible. Okay, this person really does care about me. That actually leads me to a question when you think about trust, oftentimes trust is synonymous with vulnerability. If I trust somebody, I have to feel okay being vulnerable in front of them. And you have a particularly vulnerable or potentially vulnerable clientele that we're discussing. And it has to be built typically on evidence. They have to have experiences with somebody before I can trust them. A lot of times I feel like leaders are looking for that easy button. I say something, I do something, I'm trusted, this is great. Now I can move at a higher speed in my organization. What have you and your team learned about building trust with people who have probably gone through their lives, unfortunately, being victimized or hurt by people that they previously entrusted? I think the biggest thing that we do is try to be transparent, right? We establish some clear parameters like this is who you go to for this. This is what we will do here. This is what we won't do up here, right? And I think just being open to that and 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 not having any expectations. Like I don't go into serving someone with expectations. Remember, I'm, I, I don't like to assume things. And so we just say, if you want to engage this way, then we will help you. And if you don't, then we will help you do something else. We're not here to force you to do anything. We're here to hear you out and support you on your journey. And I think it's important for every leader to realize that the people that you engage with, they're not engaging on your journey. You're engaging in their journey. They have their own journey. They have their own family. They have their own trajectory. And what you're doing could potentially impact in a a negative way or a positive way. And so you got to be very careful when you invite yourself into somebody else's journey. And so when I go into and when our team goes into service, I try to tell them, remember, they're coming from somewhere and they're headed to somewhere and we have to be the medium between the two. Right. So whether that's they're coming from trauma and they're headed to a better place, we've got to figure out how to bridge that gap. And so the best way to do that is just complete transparency. Right. Just complete transparency. And then some what I would call 
um, self-effacing stuff. So you just kind of uh, laugh at yourself a little bit, right? Um, I, I always love the uh, situation where um, there's that Adam Sandler movie where the kid um, uses a bathroom in his pants and then Adam Sandler uses the bathroom in his pants not to make the kid feel bad. Not that I'm condoning that movie or Adam Sandler or anything like that, right? But you, you sometimes it's okay, not sometimes, all the time, it's okay to take the focus off of what people might have made fun of them about and make fun of yourself a little bit, right? You be the person where all the negativity can come. Oh, own that. I can take ownership of that. You can put your negative stuff here. I can handle that. If you if you think I'm a bad person, that's fine. Let me just say that to me and we'll move on. And, and when you figure out that I'm on your team, then that doesn't change me, right? So I think being transparent, sometimes making yourself the target helps. Um, because if they're the target of the services, they may be more rejecting of that, you know? And so it's like, Hey, you know, I need a job, you know, this is what I do for a job. I'd love to do it with you or for you. You're the boss. I'm not the boss. You know, everybody here calls me the boss. And I literally to every one of them say, no, you're the boss. You're the boss. You're the boss. So I think just giving them some ownership helps them to, take back their journey. And uh, and that's why we have person-centered planning. So it goes all the way around them. That's why we do what we do. Transparency and, and you know, take a little bit of the negativity to yourself and don't try to put that on them and then give them ownership. All great points. And for me, as I listen to you throughout the duration of our conversation, the lessons in leadership that are continuing to come from your experience working with your clientele, your dedication to investing in lives and enhancing lives and building into people, it translates across the board. I'd like to flip the coin a little bit. Or flip the coin is probably not the right way to say it. We'll change direction. I'll come up with a better analogy later, I promise. Uh, when I, the high school that I graduated from, we had kids with developmental disabilities in our regular classrooms with us. And that was my first introduction into the world that you operate in every single day. And I know that had a, a big impact on me. And I spent some time associated with the Institute on Disability at the University of New Hampshire and was in some different programs. There's exceptions to every rule, of course. My opinion from that experience to this day is still pretty strong that for the vast majority of people, that was a beneficial experience for the students with disabilities, as well as the students who were not categorized with disabilities in the classroom. Now, I saw some outliers where it wasn't necessarily the case. And OK, just looking at the, the, the main part of that scale, I think is very beneficial. So let's talk about what you've seen from people's coworkers. When you help place people, whether it's in a manufacturing job or a retail job or somewhere else, and you give them that freedom, that ownership, that ability to have responsibility, take their mom to lunch, participate in things that we all take for granted. And honestly, going to work, sometimes things we don't necessarily want to do. How do you see that impact extend to their coworkers? Sure. I... Um... This is one of the funniest stories of my career, um, but I was training a guy to be the cleaning captain uh, for a fast food restaurant. And if you know anything about cleaning captains, it's basically the job that most people don't want. You got to go outside, scrub the drive through pad. You got to clean the windows around the restaurant. This is the scut work, right? And and a lot of times that's what people with disabilities get relegated to, right? Unfortunately. Um, and so I'm training him on this and, you know, this, the, the manager who had been out, come out and was like, Hey, you know, guy's name, Billy, Bob, whatever we want to call him. Right. Um, Cause I've got to protect HIPAA, you know, um, Billy says, um, you know, Hey, how are you? And the guy goes, you know, we got a squeegee to clean those windows with, you don't have to get up on that ladder and use those paper towels. And the guy instantaneously, like he just loses his cool. Like just cussing, carrying on. He looks at me and he goes, they got a, you know, blah, 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 squeegee. And I'm up here like this. And the guy looks at me like mortified. 
And he was like, I'm sorry, I was just trying to help. And I'm like, you did help. In the long run, you helped. But in this moment, he can be pissed because he's been doing this like this for weeks and no one said anything until you get here, right? And so I feel like working with people with disabilities, you do one of two things. You either ignore the disability and treat them just like anybody else, or you uh, you you try to help them even though they may not need help, right? Um, and, and so it's funny, this gentleman was actually treating him like somebody without a disability and just saying, hey, look, man, we got a different way we can do this. And I mean, he was pissed. And I'd have been pissed too, to be honest with you. Yeah. If I'd been wiping these windows for several weeks and all my teammates hadn't told me that that there's a better way to do it, right? Um, and and so that taught me that you know people will take one or two roads. They'll either not engage, or they'll they'll do something that that really is meaningful. And that manager of that restaurant did a meaningful task. He come out here and he intervened and changed the way this guy was doing his job to help him out. Um, shame on the other folks that knew this. And did not, you know, I, heck, I don't know every restaurant's protocol. I don't know what kind of tools they got. I just know that this is on his checklist and we got to teach him how to do it, you know? Um, and there wasn't anything in the the closet that would say otherwise that, you know, there's a different way. So how am I supposed to know this? But, uh, but yeah, I think folks will go one or two routes. They just kind of disengage or they do engage. And here at EDI, it's, it's kind of crazy because our folks, they just co-mingle right it's like we're just one team it's not like a i'm more valuable than you or i don't have a disability you have a disability it's just like it's team udi and we're we're kicking butt and taking names and you know uh, i love it when some of our non-disabled right there's your tag your label our non-disabled workers uh jump in and do things for our disabled workers that in a normal workplace you'd never do like help them go to the bathroom right have someone in a wheelchair they need to use a urinal or a hoya lift to get onto the toilet or whatever and our team just goes in and does it like it's it's nothing right and i'm not talking about the people we pay to do that i'm talking about anybody on our team will do that including myself because we understand that we're working with people with disabilities they're no different than we are and we're all on the same team we're going to get it accomplished um and i very honest with our folks. If you are not comfortable with that, you don't work here. And I wish every workplace was like that. I wish every workplace was like, you know what? This population has value. They bring value. They're not going to be our mascot, right? They're not going to be, oh, we hired the token person with disabilities to roll silverware. They're going to be an integral part of our workforce, and they're going to do something meaningful. We're going to treat them with respect, and we're going to help them the way we would want to be helped if we were having to deal with those kinds of situations, it's like um, if you ever work with somebody and they break their foot, everybody in the whole office is doing everything they freaking possibly can to help them out because they broke their foot and they feel bad, right? You bring somebody in a wheelchair who has a disability, it's like, oh, well, you know, they have a disability. They probably figured out how to do this already. So they're making assumptions, right? Um, so it's just challenging, but I think people in their heart, want to help. I think the the fear of doing something wrong probably prevents people from helping some. I think that's a very fair statement. The fear of doing something wrong, um, the fear of being misunderstood, like, you know, I'm just trying to help. I wasn't trying to make somebody upset. I'm, I'm just trying to help. And I wonder how much something like the bystander effect comes into play. Like nobody else is helping. So if I'm the one that steps up to help, that feels awkward to me. I want to do the right thing, but I don't I don't see an avenue to do it. So I would love to ask you this question, knowing that ignoring somebody isn't the right answer and knowing that doing too much for them isn't the right answer. What guidance can you provide for people for participating in somebody's life, joining their journey to steal one of your phrases in a helpful and productive way, knowing person to person is going to be different, but just general guidelines. I think the first thing you have to do is you have to observe, right? Right. Uh, observation is key to anything. Um, you don't want to, you know, I always say this, uh, you see two people arguing, you don't step in because you don't know enough about that argument. And and then that aggression can turn towards you, right? Then you're two on one. Like, who do you freaking think you are? You know, this is between us. 
So I, I think you have to observe before you engage, right? If you observe them struggling, then you can make the offer. But you don't just say, oh, I'm sure they can't do that. I'll do that for them. Um, I remember my wife and I, when we had first met, I had an individual, he lived independently. Um, he had cerebral palsy. He was a very, very talented um, sous chef. Uh, and he would be able to sit at his table and do everything and just kind of pass it off. And um, he invited us over and he made um, a lemon piccata chicken and then a lemon vinaigrette uh, uh, sauce for the salad or seasoning for the salad. The meal was freaking phenomenal. And then he gave us banana pudding. And then he says, oh, by the way, this banana pudding is in Paula Dean's um, cookbook. He goes, it's my recipe. Here's my card. And he shows us where she hand wrote him something to say, thank you so much. We're adding this to our cookbook. And I'm like, you would look at him. You would never think he's that talented, but he is that talented. And um, we were just amazed at the talents that he had. And so I said that to say, you know, um, don't don't make the assumption and jump in there. Right. Observe a little bit and then offer assistance when and where applicable and know when to back out. Right. That's the biggest thing for me is knowing when to let go um, when you're training your kids to ride a bike right? There's going to be some times they fail. We have to be comfortable with people with disabilities having the same level of failures in a workplace as a normal worker, right? I mean, how many times have we had normal workers in our workplace make big mistakes? And we got to figure that stuff out. Got to be comfortable with somebody with a disability making a mistake. Oh, I sent the email to the wrong person. I'm sorry. You know, we have that happen all the time. Well, what if they said the wrong thing? When they answered the phone at the reception desk, you know, what if they gave too much information to a reporter because they are trusting? Like, we need to understand that we, they, they're they going to make mistakes like anybody else, but it doesn't make them different. So I think uh, just observe, observation, inter, in, in, integrating yourself into the moment when it's possible and when it's necessary, and then back out when you need to. I appreciate that. Thank you. Just keeping on the clock here. I know you're very busy and I could ask you questions all day long. Uh, but before we, or as we start to, to wrap this conversation up, what should employers know or what should they consider if they are looking at, as you said, not bringing on a mascot, but integrating people that might have these intellectual or developmental disabilities, but can add so much to their organization? What should, what should they know? What should they consider? Well, the first thing they should know is you're going to get a very dependable worker. Um, they uh, Most folks with disabilities have not been able to have a job. So when they get that job, they are all in on that job. They eat, sleep, and drink coming to work. I mean, they lay out their clothes. They got their uniforms, whatever it is. I mean, it's, it's ready. And they're going to show up and they're going to do their best for you. They may need some training. They may need additional supports, but they're going to give you everything they can possibly give you. Um, the second thing about folks with disabilities in the workplace is we as businesses have the ADA, uh, Americans with Disability Act, and we're supposed to make reasonable accommodations for people with disabilities to be able to work in our workplaces. Now, most employers will say, well, what's a reasonable accommodation? But when you look at the world we live in, a reasonable accommodation now is I need to be remote or I need a standing desk or and we've changed radically our workplaces to keep people engaged and employed in our companies. I mean, companies have spent millions, if not billions of dollars figuring out how to uh, accommodate the modern worker. But yet people with disabilities are over here on the sidelines. And there's not a lot of money going into how to make them successful in the workplace. 75% or better is the last statistic I read of people with disabilities that are out of work. Do you know what kind of influx of working, you know, workforce that is? If we could figure out ways to meaningfully engage the individuals and get them into our workforce, there would be no shortages. We lived in the pandemic era. We are a quasi-manufacturing company, right? We do sub-assembly, that kind of stuff. 
uh, packaging, barcoding, that uh, the things that are needed, but sometimes still require hand stuff. And we delivered 100% on time every single order throughout the pandemic. I don't know anybody else that can say that. I mean, but we did that with people with disabilities because they are committed to their job. And when you engage them in meaningful ways, they will deliver. And so if we could get more folks with disabilities into the workforce, I think we would see a, an increased efficiency and an overall more empathetic workforce along with the energy they bring. Like it is electric the moment our people walk in in the morning. They are excited to be here. They have music playing. They are jumping around. They just, I mean, so they bring something that most workplaces desperately need, which is not a mascot but a true example of just pure heart, pure thought, and pure drive to succeed. I appreciate you, Sharon, and I hope that's a message that fond legs and more and more and more organizations can hear and appreciate and understand. So let's go out on a, on a high note with that. Let me ask you this, for anyone that's looking to learn more about you, learn more about UDI, where can they go to find more about David Casper and Union Diversified Industries? Well, first off, there's there's not much more to me. I'm not, <laughs> not a complex being, um, but you can check me out on LinkedIn. Um, I'm, I'm not a social media guy, just to be transparent. Um, I do have a LinkedIn profile. You can check me out there. Um, for UDI, we have YouTube, Instagram, uh, Facebook, and LinkedIn. You can also go to our website at www.udinc.org. Um, or if you're in the Union County area, just come by our place over at 2815 Walkup Avenue, ask for a tour and see it in action. It is some amazing stuff. I cannot overstate how proud I am of the people in this building for the work that they do each day. They are amazing folks and they enhance lives. And I am proud to be a part of that. Well, I'm proud to just seen it from the outside. You do amazing work. Your team does amazing work. Thank you for taking the time today to share your message. The stories you shared were amazing. I really appreciate the entire conversation. I'm going to be excited to share this and I'll make sure all the links that you just mentioned are in the show notes. So anyone who's looking to go to any of UDI social media pages, learn more about the organization, will have the opportunity to do it. And I'm looking forward to the next time you and I get to shake hands. I really appreciate you taking the time to be here today, David. Thank you so very much. Hey, thank you so much. I appreciate you bringing this forum together. Um, I have listened to the other episodes and Man, you're an amazing and artful question uh, person. Uh, I think you do a phenomenal job just framing the conversation. And so thank you for giving me the opportunity to share about people with disabilities and just kind of seeing it through a different lens. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And this is the least I can do to try to help you in your missions. So I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Take care of yourself. We'll see you again soon. Sounds great. Thanks. David, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. I hope everyone who listened got just as much out of that conversation as I did. Your story is inspiring. The work that your organization does is so inspiring. Thank you for dedicating so much of your life to building into others and giving people who might not have a voice in normal circumstances the opportunity to experience so much more in life. And there are so many lessons that we can all learn from what you and your team do every day in order to make us better leaders, fathers, mothers, community members, and more. Thank you so much. And of course, thank you to everybody that took the time to listen today. We really appreciate you taking the time to join us. And I can't go anywhere without thanking our sponsors. A big thank you to Humantel. Again, for everybody interested in learning more about how to accurately evaluate changing emotions in your counterparts, specifically by watching their face and their nonverbal behavior, please check out humantel.com and enter the code in of 25 for 25% off of all of their online training. I've completed it personally, can't recommend it enough. Also, for people interested in learning more about emotional intelligence, please check out ei excuse me ei magazinecom for Emotional Intelligence Magazine and check out their ever-expanding library of articles, videos, blogs, 
podcast interviews, webinars, in-person content, and more. Check out Emotional Intelligence Magazine. And of course, for the professional interviewers, please head over to certifiedinterviewer.com to learn more about the International Association of Interviewers. Dive into their content library. Check out their resources for professional interviewers. Look into their networks. Is the membership right for you and your organization? While you're there, check out the CFI designation. Is that right for you at this point in your career as an investigator as well? That's another organization that's dedicated to furthering the field of interview and interrogation, please take the time to check out the International Association of Interviewers at CertifiedInterviewer.com. Thank you all again for taking the time to join us and please do what the algorithms ask us to do. Like the show, share the show, comment on the show, share your feedback with us. If there's anything you'd like to see more of or less of, if you have great guests in mind, please let us know. We would love to hear your feedback as we're constantly looking to adapt and evolve as we go. Thank you all very much. Stay safe. Take care of each other, and we'll see you next time.